Hi there. This is an updated overview on everything we know about the three different dragon breeds that were introduced in the prequel series House of the Dragon. This is part of a series of videos I'm making going over all the new details we got from the recent behind-the-scenes making-of book by Gina McIntyre. Unfortunately, it didn't say that much, and I'm disappointed with it. I talked about this in my longer 40-minute audio-only interview that turns out someone pointed me to a podcast Ryan Condal did back in May. He had hoped that this would be a detailed behind-the-scenes book like the Making of the Godfather trilogy, or he his hope was it would be like Future Noir, this benchmark behind-the-scenes book on the making of Blade Runner. And it turned out to be a coffee table book focused mostly on just promo shots we already had. Like full page promo shots. I talked about this, that they only show the final versions of concept art. So there's like four pages, these two double page spreads of Vagar concept art, which is the final version. And the annoying thing is the concept artist, um, Constantine Sakaris, the week it came out, he posted early concept art of Vagar to his Instagram that wasn't in the book. Just showing, oh, this is an early version of Vagar with horns, before we came up with the idea that her horns snapped off with age. That should have been in the book. It isn't. They cut it entirely. So that's upsetting. On top of this, just to show you how little attention this really paid to the designers, it consistently misspells his name. And he's mentioned like a dozen times in this chapter, and even like big quotes in a, long, in a larger font of, quote, Constantine Sakaris. If you saw my preceding video, I'm annoyed about this, the one about Moondancer, where I kept saying on slides, Sir Karis, with two R's, S-E-R-K, that isn't how you spell his name. And then I went to Instagram to write this video uh, based on stuff he said. His name is spelled S-E-K, Sakaris. That the book paid such little atten attention to the concept artist, it consistently misspells his name. So it offered nothing we hadn't already heard in other interviews. There's like one or two extra details. And I was deeply disappointed with this. But the last time I made a big video about the three dragon breeds is when we first found out about it, like the week before the premiere. I have been paying attention to every interview in the past six months where they mention something about the dragons, and I managed to ask Sakaris two different things over, over time. I, I can't find the original slides, but the last one I did, I have a screenshot here, where I asked him about the dragon breeds when he posted the Vagar image, and I said, hey, can I interview you, text, audio, whatever, about the dragon designs? And he said, oh, I'd love to, but I have to check with legal. But, you know, the book is coming out le next week. Let's see what it says. <laughs> and it said nothing we hadn't heard about publicly before and misspelled his name <laughs> consistently. <laughs> so this video is sort of my prayer to the heavens of if I can do a really good overview of this, I'm hoping it might get Sakaris to answer some of my questions, some more of my questions, but don't hold your breath on that. I'm not trying to lead you by the nose on that of will I be able to interview the concept artist, but he answered two questions I had which seemed pretty interesting. There's two points of information he did give me. So the point of this video is... This is the guide to dragon breed designs this book should have given you, but didn't. Which I have cobbled together from a dozen different sources cross-referenced from things they mentioned scattered throughout other interviews. That this is what you deserve, this is what we should have had, what the book should have provided. That no one went, wow, I want a coffee table book filled with promo photos that are already available on the internet. They wanted new information. Well, to dive into it, six months ago, they said that there's basically three breeds of dragon, based on skull shape. And keep in mind, this is before season one, so we only had the trailers to go by. We'd only seen Caraxes, Vagar, Cyrax. We hadn't really seen Fermax and Arax and all the younger ones yet. They said there's three kinds. There's ones with T-Rex-shaped dinosaur-like skulls. Then there's ones with long and narrow horse-like skulls. And then there's ones with 
wolf-shaped skulls. So, clearly, Drogon and Daenerys' dragons, they're the T-Rex-shaped head ones. Beleriand was, too. He looks powerfully built. But Cyrax is, Rhaenyra's dragon, is the horse-shaped skulls. And the wolf-shaped skulls are Caraxes, Vermax, and Arax, though, as it turns out, Caraxes really shouldn't be used as a template for that. What new information has come out since then? Well, the book reiterated one point about dragon breeds, which Ryan Condal had already given in that behind-the-scenes series, uh, The House of Dragons Built. And I, I reported on it at the time. I said, wow, Condal finally said what, what, what the function of the other breeds are. He said that Cyrax is bred for speed, that her breed is the fast breed. And they reiterate this in the book. The one new detail from Zacharis is he said, it was modeled after the Concorde jet, that European supersonic jet from the 70s to 90s. And looking at them side by side, yeah, it's got this really long, narrow nose like a supersonic jet. But we basically knew they're bred for speed already. Sakaris told me two things that we didn't know already, but he didn't want to give exclusive info yet, but he was pointing out things from on screen that were obvious. First of which is, they have mentioned this in other, other interviews, Caraxes is basically a mutant and should not be used as our template for the wolf skull ones. That for a time, in my first video I was using that as, the wolf-shaped ones must have this squiggly body. No, that's something unique to Caraxes. That when you look at the dragons of Rhaenyra's sons, um, Vermax and Arax, they don't look like Caraxes. They look like it took a Caraxes head and put it on a normal dragon body. That Vermax is going to, going forward, those are our template for the wolf-headed ones, not Caraxes. So point one of two here talking about him, he reiterated this, that uh, Ryan Condal also reiterated it in the book, that it's like he's deformed or a mutation or something, that he's not a normal dragon template. And they didn't go into too much detail about that, but one thing that Sakaris did tell me, well, he pointed out, because it is on screen, he said, notice that his flames are unusually hot. That when Caraxes burns soldiers in the Stepstones, they instantly vaporize. You don't see that with sea smoke when he's burning guys in the Stepstones. I thought, well, it's because he's younger. They say dragon flame gets stronger the older they get. That, like, Beleriand and, and now Vagar, when she's the size of Beleriand, uh, their flames were hot enough to melt stone. Yeah, but even then, when you see Vagar like, burning Lena and stuff, it isn't this instantaneous vaporization where there's just nothing left. It just poof into ash. The, and even then, like, Caraxes is half of Vagar's size. He shouldn't be at that level of heat yet. And he might even be hotter. So he has unusually hot flames, and I think it, this is pure fanon. I think it might be because the flame chemical glands in his neck are overdeveloped because he has an unusually long neck. Oh, that's a thing, um, when they were designing dragons on Game of Thrones. I don't know if they... I can't confirm if this is the inspiration they took, but I know George R. R. Martin is a fan of the dragon designs in that old Christian Bale kind of cheesy movie, uh, Reign of Fire. And in that movie they explain that, well, there is kind of a realistic way that dragons could be you know, expelling flame from their bodies, that you, when you look at them they have these two tubes in the back of their throat. And it's a binary compound, you know, like epoxy, that there's two chemicals that burst into flame when they mix like Greek fire or something, that it is a chemical fire that individually these things won't burn. So when you looked in the throat of Daenerys' dragon season two or season three, you could see they have these tubes in the back of their throat that expel chemicals that burn when they mix. So my pet theory is because he has a longer neck, he has overdeveloped flame glands. But they didn't confirm that or anything. The rest of this is pure speculation on Caraxes, though. Why is he squiggly like that? I had a cat that was longer and thinner like that, and I'm saying he's squiggly compared to the template of a normal standard cat, so some people say Caraxes is noodly. I say he's squiggly like a cat. 
but why is he like that? Why is he drawn out like that? And in, in the in, behind the scenes stuff on this, they say, well, he's a little more inspired by Asian dragons. He's a little more snake like, but that's out of universe. In universe, is, is he a mutation? Is he a point mutation? Is he a deformed? Is he a genetic atavism? I mean, a genetic throwback to something. This is pure fan theory, but um, my personal uh, view, my personal theory, is that Caraxes is a bit of a genetic throwback to a fireworm. That whereas most dragons are like a 50-50 split, he's like 60-40. He's a little more fireworm than the normal one. Of If you're not familiar with this, the theory that some in the books have come up with, because they don't know where dragons came from, and they were thousands of years old. They, there's speculation by Septon Barth, who was hand of the King to Jaehaerys, he wrote about this. He said, from what lore I've been able to piece together, it seems, or at least the Valyrians believed, that they made dragons by mixing and matching other animals. And we know that there's other things the Valyrians would mix and match animals using blood magic. And it stands to reason, he says, I think they made dragons as these genetic chimeras, these sphinxes, by mixing wyverns and fireworms using blood magic. And they do look similar. You can tell that they, they do look like they're made of parts of both animals. A wyvern is basically a pterodactyl. There's a lot of them. They live in the jungles of Sothorios, the, the southern continent which is inspired by you know, its fantasy Africa. And he says, I think they took wyverns, which are like pterodactyls, and mixed them with fireworms. We haven't heard of what fireworms are in great detail, other than they were this kind of burrowing animal that lived... They, they tunneled around the caves within the volcanoes that surround Valyria. Now, there are all these vast slave-worked mines that they build into the volcanoes and their constant hunger for gold and metals and building materials. So there's these volcanic mines that would intersect with the natural tunnels built by the fireworms, and there's all these stories about how they'd wipe out entire mines of slaves when they'd accidentally tunnel into a fireworm nest, that sort of thing. And it says the smallest ones were the size of a child's arm, but they could grow to immense size, like dragon size. And based on what we've heard of them, the fireworms, well, they could breathe fire, and they were apparently some type of... it, it looked like a burrowing snake. Whereas wyverns, like pterodactyls, they had beaks instead of jaws, and they couldn't breathe fire. So they must have mixed them together to make the modern dragon. And my theory is that Whereas most dragons are like a 50-50 split between wyvern DNA, as it were, and fireworm DNA, for whatever reason, Caraxes is like a 60-40 or even 70-30 split, that he expresses an unusually high amount of, of genetic influence from fireworm DNA, is a little more dominant. You know, it's like when you're breeding dogs. It's not Genetics isn't just mixing paint. That sometimes you, you get, you've been true breeding like a Doberman for three generations, and then you get one that looks like it has poodle hair on top of a Doberman, and you go, well, its great-grandparent was a, was a poodle, but we thought we bred it out. It must have just gone recessive. And then it resurfaces again as like a genetic throwback. Been known to happen, like when Viserys in the show is saying, you know, nature is a funny thing with inheritance. You know, yes, Rhaenyra's sons have dark hair and pale skin and look nothing like Laenor, but, you know, I had a horse that didn't look like either of its parents. It looked like its grandparents. There's recessive traits that Laenor's grandparents were Baratheons. Rhaenys is half Baratheon. The seed is strong. It just went recessive. But, no, no, no seriously, another thing, like dog breeding, horse breeding, you go... Oh, it came out looking like a great grandparent that we thought it didn't. We had bred that out, and turns out we didn't. So my theory is that Caraxes is showing a bit more fireworm influence, not fully, because like fireworms couldn't fly; they didn't have wings. That he still has to be light enough to be able to fly. That a, a fireworm m might have been even more snake-like than him. So, but it's a little hint at he's a little closer, like a step or two closer to what a fireworm looked like. Not entirely. Just a little hint that he's a little proportionately different in terms of his genetic makeup. But taking those two details and running with it, that 
he looks longer and more snake-like than the standard template. This has nothing to do with his breed as a wolf-headed one. It's he's this genetic mutation. And two, the concept artist did point out to me, notice that his flames are unusually hot. That he vaporizes things instantly. Well, these sound like the traits of a fireworm, unusually hot and, and snake-like. Just my theory, anyway. This is all just context, because it's establishing he shouldn't be the template for the wolf-headed ones. The wolf-headed ones are things like Vermax and Arax. The dragons of Rhaenyra's sons are what you should think of, that it's based purely on head shape. That even Cyrax, who's bred for speed, as they said in interviews, she doesn't look that much thinner than the, the other dragons. I mean, Caraxes is an oddity, but compare... Cyrax's body to Vermax's body or Sea Smoke, it's not noticeably thinner unless you look closely. That it's based purely on head morphology, head shape. Which brings me to the second of the two things that Sakaris told me over social media. Again, he was sticking to obvious things he could point at the TV show and go, well, obviously this, because he didn't want to get in trouble if he didn't have permission. He pointed out to me the purpose and function of the breed with T-Rex-shaped heads. He pointed out that clearly they have the strongest head, the most muscular head, designed for the strongest bite force. So, obviously, these are clearly... War dragons. These are the ones bred for strength and combat. Which makes sense. That's why he was willing to point it out. That compared to like a Cyrax head, where it's this narrow, horse-shaped head, between the two, which one do you think is the war dragon? Clearly the T-Rex ones. So that narrows it down. That the T-Rex-shaped heads are war dragons. Cyrax bred for speed. What does that mean exactly? What is the function of the wolf-shaped head breed? Well, to answer this, I, this is now my speculation and just logical deduction, working backward from horse and dog breeds, the functions that these breeds are for, as that's defined, not, you know, cosmetic breeds or, you know, like, like cat breeds where it looks slightly different. It's relatively simplistic when you're just going by category of this is this type of horse, this is a horse bred for travel, this is a horse bred for war, and we can pretty much figure this out. Start with brief overview of the kinds of horse breeds, the categories of horse breeds at least, that are mentioned in the books. A heavy, strong, nice horse bred to be a war horse is called a destrier that it has to be able to charge short distances, but it's bred for size and strength. So the T-Rex head ones are basically Destrier dragons, war horse dragons. The next most common breed you hear about in the books are Palfrey horses. Palfreys are bred for endurance, not strength, for long distance travel. They can carry a decent amount of weight, but they're not meant to be fast. They're meant for travel from point A to point B. That I don't think they're really good sprinters, for you need a short sprint to go into battle. Then you have something that's a plow horse. The proper term for that is a dray. That a dray, this is like a Clydesdale, it's meant to haul things. It's meant to haul a heavy wagon, it's meant to haul a plow... This is stronger than a Destrier, but it has no speed at all. This is something that's purely meant to haul things, doesn't need to be fast, it can't charge. And they say that, you know, in a pinch you can use a Dray in combat, but it'll tire out. It's not really the best choice. I don't think we'd ever see the dragon version of a Dray, of a plow horse, something slow that isn't meant to charge. It's meant for construction purposes. I don't think we'd ever see that unless there's like a Valyria prequel or we see them like working on the Valyrian megastructures. That'd be cool. I think there's some breeds that we would not see in House of the Dragon that we might see in a Valyria prequel, like their version of a heavy construction dragon that's too slow to ever use in combat because it's so strong and so heavy. It's like the difference between an Olympic-level deadlift weightlifter 
and a football linebacker. You know, like you need some speed to be you know, in sport versus I'm a pure weightlifter. Different needs. But getting back to palfreys, palfreys aren't bred for speed. They are bred for endurance. So if you say something's bred for speed, like they don't have bred for pure speed racing horses aren't really that common. I don't think they ever mention them. Like they might be in, you know, the gladiator games in Slaver's Bay and the Free Cities for entertainment, but it's uncommon to have a horse that's bred for speed in the sense of sprinting a short distance. That isn't something very useful. That would be entertainment. Again, you might see racing dragons in a Valyria show, but not in this. There's a couple of other horse breeds in the books, but I, I don't think this really applies, that Garens are inclement weather horses, that they're bred with shaggy coats for dealing with cold weather, and they have big, wide hooves so they can travel better on snow or on rocky terrain. So the only places you see Garens are the Night's Watch, and some of the wildlings have horses. Not a lot, but enough. That, not enough for uh, charges, but enough that, like, pulling their supply train for scouts. Uh, the Iron Islands, what few horses they have purely for travel, because the ground is so stony, they have Garens. So that's where you'd see those. I don't really think you'd have an inclement weather dragon, because they're not meant to be used in cold weather. And they don't go on ground terrain. They're a flying unit, so... We, we wouldn't see that. And if you're thinking of ponies, ponies are a tiny breed of horse meant to be ridden by children or something for the, you know, the children of the rich. So, again, Valyria prequel might have a tiny training dragon breed, but I, I doubt we'd see that. So, they don't say that the horse-headed ones like Cyrax are bred for endurance. They say speed. So I don't think it's quite a palfrey dragon as such. But, checking back on the other horse breeds, I, I misremembered something. I think that the Cyrax horse-headed ones are basically the dragon version of a Dornish Sandsteed. Dornish Sandsteeds, what I, what I misremembered is, I remember them as just being like super palfreys that it said they have such great endurance they can run for a day and a night without tiring. That is true, but they also mention how swift they are, how mobile they are. That they're not pure endurance like a palfrey, they have high endurance and speed, and mobility. And just when they describe them, they consistently say how narrow and dainty their heads are, which is what you think of when you look at Cyrax, it looks like a jet. The, the idea is that you, the entire style of warfare in Dorne is different because if you had heavy cavalry with knights wearing heavy plate armor, they would bake inside of their own steel in the hot desert sun. As armies have learned time and again, you can't ride out in full plate armor on heavy horse with shock cavalry charges. It doesn't work like that. that. Instead, both for fighting off invaders and internal warfare... The style of warfare in Dorn, its mobility. It's like in the TV show when Oberyn says, oh, I don't, I'm not going to wear that much armor so I can move around more. Th that's what their fighting style is. That they wear like light leather jackets or maybe some copper discs at most. That they, they don't wear a lot of armor. And as a result, they didn't breed horses that can carry a really heavy, fully armored knight. They focused on speed. That the style of warfare in Dorne is having light mounted archers on light cavalry zipping back and forth in harassment attacks. Ride up really fast, you know, pluck away a couple of arrows at them, then ride away, flank attack with mounted archers. That's how it works there. So you don't need a horse that can carry a lot of weight. Like when Tyrion sees Oberyn's horse, he thinks, that, oh, they're so majestic, but they're so dainty, they couldn't carry a full knight. But what weight they can carry, like an unarmored person, they can ride for a day and a half without tiring. In addition to that, but checking this, I realize the book says they consistently say how swift they are. Even like there, there's a point when um, Duncan Egg in, in the prequel novels, they mention when he was in Dorne, he was marking, oh, and the Dornish Sand Seeds were so swift. So checking back, yeah, if there is one horse breed in the books that you could say is bred for speed because they don't really use racing horses, 
it's the Dorner Sandsteed. That does lead to the question with Cyrax's breed of, is this like a dragon palfrey or a, a, the, the, the racing? I think they're merged together. Like, we might as well just call them, for lack of a better term, travel dragons. I don't think they draw a distinction between one that's bred for pure endurance and one that's bred for speed with enough endurance to get you from point A to point B. I mean, it's not a racing dragon meant for going around the courtyard. It's meant for flying from, like, King's Landing to the Erie or something. Reasonably fast, fast enough that the dragon won't tire. That it'll get there in a single flight. And you, you could debate the, the, the tweaking the knobs on will it have more endurance or more speed, but clearly the thing is, it's, it's designed to be like a jet. It's a travel dragon. The closest analogy is not so much a palfrey, but a Dornish Sandsteed. That's what I think we can piece apart with them. But all of the, you know, form follows function, all this, we get, narrow it down to just what is its function and what is it doing. Okay, we have war dragons, which are destrier dragons, the T-Rex-headed ones with big bite force. And then we have the travel dragons, which are like Dornish Sandsteeds. What are the wolf skull-shaped dragons for? What function were they bred to perform? What purpose are they serving? That working backwards from function that they're based around categorized by function process of elimination, logical deduction. I think they're tracker dragons, like a hunting dog. Scouts, they're meant to track, to hunt for things like that. That we've already gone through all of the horse breeds, and when you compare to dog breeds, there's certain things dogs do that horses don't. Hunting. If it was a war dog, well, then you're back to a destrier, war horse, something that's bred for size and strength. It, it overlaps too much. If you're looking for you know, a, something bred for speed and endurance, you're basically just back to the Dornish Sandsteed with the, the travel dragon breed that Cyrax is. And all the other things you potentially could, pure strength, racing, travel, it, it overlaps with the horse stuff again. The one real difference isn't combat, but tracking. That this is something meant to be a scout, meant to hunt. And looking at its head, yeah, the difference with what is this wolf's head doing differently, it has wide-set, big eyes meant for scanning the ground. You can even see that they have ridges over their eyes, that it's hard for them to look up because they're meant to be scanning the ground. Not unlike uh, the Great Leonopteryx from Avatar, when I mean, he figures out it, it's blind from above. It isn't meant to... It, nothing hunts this, so it doesn't need to see above it, so you can have armored ridges around its eyes. The, I imagine this thing sweeping its head around, tracking, hunting for things. So I've been going through Wikipedia pages on work dogs, specifically hunting dogs. Sight hounds, scent hounds, that kind of thing. Just the shape of that, the purpose they're meant for... That kind of lines up with this. The one thing the behind-the-scenes book said slightly differently is it just emphasized they have canine-like features. It's a wolf-like head, a canine-like head. This is something meant to hunt, to track, more than just a stand-up fight. Big sense organs, meant for scanning. Now, again, the template for these is not Caraxes. He's all stretched out and elongated. The template is Vermax and Arax, who have relatively squat but wide faces, like like wolf like that. I can see how this thing is meant to, to scan like that. And just going through the historical uses of hunting dogs and things, there's actually different kinds of hunting dogs depending on what you're going for. I mean, you know, a, a dachshund is meant to go down a hole or something. Then there's retrieval dogs for when you're hunting something. And sight hounds versus smell hounds, I don't think you need to smell things from the air as much as you need to see them. Maybe it's different with a dragon, whatever. But the general idea behind a hunting dog is it's bred for big sense organs. And on top of that, it's not just a scout. No, they're bred to be cunning. And they're bred to be ferocious. Because think about it, just you're in the woods, you're sending something out against a fox or even a wolf, on its own, 
ahead of the hunters. You know, sometimes you have just the sense dogs that a human is leading on a leash because they can smell it. Then you have an actual tracker animal that is meant to go into the bush, go up against something. It is dangerous being an advanced scout because you're vulnerable to ambush. So it's not just a pile of sense organs. That These things are bred for cunning because you have to outfox the fox. You have to be able to go up against a more intelligent animal trying to run away. On top of that, you might get ambushed by a wolf or a bear. So hunting dogs are often bred for their ferocity and their cunning and to be able to fend off an animal bigger than themselves if they get surprised while they're tracking them. So thinking on it, that's kind of the breed I would want. I bet on intelligence every time. That this is something that is meant for tracking, bred for cunning, and bred for ferocity. That lines up with Caraxes' personality pretty well, even though he's a mutant. He's this off template, but there's aspects of the wolf thing to him that renowned for its cunning, that this is something you would send against a fox, against a wolf. That I think that they're essentially tracker dragons, that this is something you send out to hunt enemy armies, to, to track enemy positions, and they might run into, you know, surprise attack. You need to be able to fend that off. That just by process of elimination, what else is there? They're not the dragon version of a plow horse. They're not a palfrey. Because a palfrey, again, that's pure endurance. Whereas I think the travel dragons like Cyrax are mostly speed and more endurance than the war dragons. That they're meant to go for, uh, travel long distances relatively quickly like a Dorner Sandsteed. If this was about endurance, it would be about body shape. But they said, well, the defining difference is the head shape. Nothing about the head indicates endurance. What we do see with the wolf head-shaped ones is, well, what's the difference between a wolf and a T-Rex? Wider set, better eyes. This is something used for tracking. That's how a dog is different from, like, a T-Rex or an alligator or something. It's better for scanning. So even though they told me nothing about this, I, other than... This is logical deduction from the facts we've been able to gather across the past six months. The designer pointed out to me, obviously the T-Rex head ones have the strongest bite force. They're meant to be war dragons. That's the war breed. It's the destrier breed, like a war horse. Condal himself, behind the scenes videos and this book, said Cyrax's horse head shaped breed are fast. They're meant for travel. So they're sand steeds, they're, they're the travel dragons. And ruling out everything else and what functions do you breed animals for, going from horses to dogs, I think that the wolf-headed ones are tracker dragons. These are advanced scouts. And keep in mind, hunting dogs are known to have good endurance because you have to track something for a long distance. So maybe, I'm not sure where they fall in the endurance thing because... Consider that Vermax and Arax are very young, yet they are still able to fly long distances. Just as Daenerys' dragons were kind of fudging it with how could they fight so well so young? Well, because they're the war breed. How is it that Arax is barely bigger than a horse, but he's able to carry Luke from Dragonstone to Storm's End? That Vermax, who isn't much bigger, is able to fly from Dragonstone to the Eyrie from there to White Harbor, and from there to Winterfell, that this might be this long-distance tracker breed. Might give a hint of how he was able to do... Now, when it comes to travel, you know, for speed purposes and stuff, you know, that's probably the, the travel breed like Cyrax, but still just this idea that what do hunting dogs do? So I'm going to ask the creators on that, but I think, like, what else could it be? Tell me in the comments. That it could mean a couple of things. Well, does that more endurance, less endurance? But the general idea is it must be basically a hunting dog, like a something cunning, ferocious with big sense organs that you send out after the fox, that you send out after the enemy army that's hiding in the hills, and it's cunning enough that it can dodge an ambush. That's what I think that breed is for. But I'll have to ask, and let's see if they're able to tell me. Rounding all of this out, what dragons haven't been established on screen yet? 
One little detail the books gave is they mention in passing that Vermax and Arax's brother Tyraxes, Joff's dragon, he's the same breed that they are, the canine breed. So okay, we've established that. Uh, they also mention in passing that Vermithor's mate, Silverwing, is slender. So she's not a as overgrown as he is. That It's not so much an age thing as a size thing. That they said Vagar has grown up so big and so old that she's collapsing in on herself. Vermithor is almost as big as Vagar, and you can see he's deteriorating a little from his size. That some of his horns are starting to snap off. You see that. Now, some people point that out to me, but Dreamfire is slightly older than Vermithor and Silverwing, but it's more of a size than an age thing. It's like how like a really big dog will won't live as long as has health problems. But a smaller, normal-sized dog will live longer. That the books do say that Dreamfire is slender. It, it stands to reason to me that the brief times we see her, she doesn't look that old because she's holding up well because she's smaller. That that makes sense to me at least. Of well, she's holding up better, and it's a difference of a decade or two compared to you know like hundred-year-old Vermithor versus a, a decade-old dragon. But okay, Silverwing, I would guess because she's supposed to be graceful and beautiful. Probably the travel breed, because you, you hear of Alisan traveling all the way to the wall. It's supposed to be delicate and graceful. My my speculation is that Silverwing is like Cyrax. We got a brief look at Dreamfire Sunfire. There was some concept art of Sunfire. I cannot tell what breed he's supposed to be, other than he's not the fast version. I think he's the war version because he's heavy set, but because he's really ferocious and good in combat. But we'll see about that. We haven't seen Moondancer. I made a whole video about that, that they accidentally revealed that, you know, she has this really interesting design with a mohawk and intricate scale patterns, but I can't guess from that what breed Moondancer is supposed to be. Taraxes, they said, is like his brother's Moondancer. I'm not sure. Big question mark for me is Tessarian. Tessarian, Dayron's dragon, it's light. It's about the same size as Sea Smoke. It's a juvenile just, it's not quite as big as, you know, like a full-blown adult yet, but it's effective in battle if there's not fighting another dragon. I have no idea what kind Tessarian would be relative to her function, because she's younger. Then, well, we've already covered the three riderless dragons, because we know Sea Smoke, we know Vermithor. They mentioned that Silverwing is slender, because she holds up well. The only other ones are the three wild dragons. I'll leave at that. Because they have said, since that first article, right before the premiere, they said, officially our favorite designs are the wild dragons. We've designed all of them already, they just don't show up until a later season. Because we're establishing how they're different from the trained castle dragons. That little things like, they explain how we had to think of how they bolt in the saddle to their scales, because the scales are so heavy you can nail things into them they won't notice. And that as they get bigger, they take them out. If you look closely, you can see where these bolts are, where they keep the saddles on. And they explain the wild ones don't have that. It's They're Mustangs, wild horses. They've never ha had a saddle or a bit or anything. And they're just different because they've grown up feral. So I really look forward to those. And they said Moondancer was intentionally an off-template, interesting design. That'll be good. What would the wild dragons be, if I just had to speculate on this? The cannibal is probably a war dragon. He's huge, he's almost as big as Vermithor, he's older. But they say he, he, the cannibal could plausibly be from a different lineage. I don't believe that, but it's plausible. They said some people think he's from a different Valyrian dragon lineage. He just happened to survive the doom, came to nest on Dragonstone and he eats the Targaryen dragons whenever he can, and some people go, maybe he went insane from all the inbreeding, maybe he's a different breed, that might make sense. But I think he's a war dragon, but of such a different style that you could look at him and go, well, it's like the difference between a Rottweiler and, and a Doberman. These are both guard dogs, war dogs, they just look different. So he might be this other kind of war, there might be more than one sub-variant of war dragon and he has to look different enough in his facial proportions that you could wonder maybe he, he he could plausibly be a different lineage altogether or maybe he just grew that way we don't know gray ghost 
is he's a cutie. He's small and slender, delicate, and hides from man. They say at the first sight of a human or a ship on the horizon, this thing will dart away really fast. So I think it stands to reason Grey Ghost is probably of the travel breed. We have the war breed, the travel breed, and the tracker breed. Then you have Sheep Stealer, who is described as both ugly and slender. But he's, he's big, but he's slender. I think of him like a wolf stealing sheep. He's this feral dragon that'll sneak up, snatch some sheep. Uh, he's cunning to survive. So much like a wolf, I think, you know, he should prop like a wolf stealing sheep, he should probably have a wolf-shaped head. He, I think he's one of the tracker dragon breed, just because, you know, he's a wolf stealing sheep. But that'll be interesting seeing the wild dragons that think about it, in, in term, not just in terms of design, but in terms of their behavior and their interaction with people that... Remember when Amond claimed Vagar? Vagar has had at least three riders before him. And, you know, he's a prince of the royal blood. It sniffs him at first, goes, oh, you're a Targaryen. Okay, then he tries to claim it. He knows the voice commands that they've been trained, and Vagar has been trained with three other riders already. These are the voice commands. Like, I've heard how, like, some people with hunting dogs, they'll, they'll train them to respond in German or something, just because that's where the breed was trained. It, it, it varies, or horses that are trained in a, commands in a specific language, so if you, like, get a racehorse from Spain, you need to give the commands in Spanish or something. Vagar knew the command words that Amon was giving her. Lykiri, calm, Doheris, serve. If you walked up to Sheep Stealer and calmly said... Lykiri, he would bite you in half. He was never trained with the command phrases in High Valyrian like you saw them doing in the Dragon Pit. And it's not just because he's, oh, he's a bad temperament. He, he physically was never trained with the voice commands. So I, I, I'm hoping we have a scene like that when they introduce the Wild Dragons, have someone trying to claim Sheep Stealer using the voice commands have someone kill him and someone point out they weren't trained to follow the voice commands. They don't know what you're saying. That'll be fun. But I, I think we can suss out what the different breeds are. And there's some debate of, is Vagar a war dragon like I think? Or is she just a really old travel dragon but she looks, you know, melted so it's hard to tell. Um, what was Meraxes? What was Quicksilver? I'm not really sure. What breed would Tessarian be? So... I'm trying to figure this out working backwards from their function and characteristics. What would you expect of something doing that? It's, it can travel really far. I always thought Dreamfire was like a palfrey dragon, like this slender, because they say she travels really far, she's slender, but they established, well, she's a, the Destrier breed because she's the mother of Daenerys' dragons, I'm not sure. But this is all we know after six months you deserved a better guide to dragon breeds and the designs behind them than we were given in that coffee table photo book uh, that should have been an extensive behind the, behind the scenes making of. I'm going to try to talk to the dragon designer again, telling him they got your name wrong, <laughs> they cut out any information you said. Can you give us more thought into the design process that went into these things? So please like and subscribe. This is part of a longer series on design stuff about the dragons, design things they mentioned in the book and other interviews. And please leave comments. I try to respond to all of them.